are continuing our series on the mind, the arena of faith, which is based upon a book written by our very own apostle Frederick Casey Price. Now, the last time we were together, we went through a whole lot. And I have a whole lot <laughs> that I want to go through or that I'm going to try to go through this evening. So we're just going to jump right in. Um, we've already talked about and what we've been speaking of so far in this series is what it means to put on the armor of God. And we've already established that the armor of God is truly the word of God and all that's involved with that. Um, we talked about how we have to call on our salvation, we have to call on our righteousness, which we need to do this daily because it's not like we left our righteousness or left our salvation. We're calling into remembrance of our own minds what means, what it means to be saved, what it means to be righteous. We have to keep, keep that in remembrance so that we know how to conduct our day-to-day -day lives. So turn with me, because I'm gonna go really quickly a little bit over what we did last week just to pull us right back to where we need to be. Turn with me to Psalms 32, and we're going to look at verse 8. And we talked about the fact that as believers, we have a privilege. We have a lot of privileges. But one of them is that God is always working on our behalf. We are not left in a position like the world. We can depend on our Heavenly Father. So if we look at Psalm 32, 8, if I share it with you out of the expanded Bible, which does give us some qualifiers, it says, the Lord says, I will make you wise, instruct you, and show, teach you where to, the way you should go. I will guide, counsel you, and watch over. My eye will be on you. In other words, this is very clearly letting us know that the Lord is paying attention to us. I think sometimes, I know, I don't have to think. I know sometimes we get so caught up in trying to make it through the day-to-day -day issues of life that we just kind of think we're out here doing it by ourselves. We know God loves us. We get that. We know that. But I don't, I, I don't believe that we really understand just how much every little detail of our lives means to him. He really cares about everything. And that's going to be another series we're going to do at some point. And I'm going to entitle it <laughs> The Wink from God. Because he really, I, little things happen in your life that's like him winking at you to kind of let you know. You know, like you may decide one day that you want to go on the market and you want to get like the perfect grapefruit. Now, I mean, come on, grapefruit is grapefruit. But maybe you really have a taste for a really, really nice grapefruit. And you don't want to go buy a whole bag full of grapefruits. You just want a grapefruit. You just want it to be just right. And you go downtown, you go in the market, you pick out a grapefruit, you go home, you cut open to it, and it's just absolute perfection. That's a wink. Because you might not have gone to the Father and said, OK, Lord, I'm asking that I'm going to go and I'm going to get the perfect grapefruit. But it was something important to you, so important to you that he made sure you had that. It's like a little wink. We don't practice his presence. We don't recognize that he's ever present in every single thing, every, every step of our life. We just have to realize it and walk with him and just allow everything to just flow. So anyway, this to me is what this is telling me. Also, if we look at it in the Amplified, it says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you, and here's the qualifier, who are willing to learn with my eye upon you. Because that's the other thing. We still have to be willing to learn. Because, you know, sometimes we're still stuck in our ways and we want to do it our way. We have to be willing to learn. And lastly, the message says, let me give you some good advice. I'm looking you in the eye and giving it to you straight. It just doesn't get better than that. Now turn with me to Luke's Gospel, the 10th chapter. And we're going to look at verses 41, 42. And we talked about how uh, and I gave you an example that a lot of people got a kick out of, where we have a tendency sometimes, again, to get so caught up in the things that we're doing that we pay more attention to what we're doing than to the importance of the word in whatever it is. 
For instance, and I gave the example, you could have a lot of people coming like, okay, Christmas is a great time. We usually have family and friends pop by, stop by. We may prepare this wonderful big dinner for them, and that's when you roll out all of the stops. You know, you take the linen out of the closet that you don't normally use. You take out, you know, the china and all the rest of that stuff. And, you know, you get so caught up in serving the people that you don't even you don't spend any time with them. You don't even get to really talk to them. You're exhausted. And some people are honest enough to admit they sit down and go, Lord, please don't bring these people back to my house again. Because it's just so much work. Because you get so caught up into the work that you don't enjoy the fellowship. I, I know I have been guilty of that, OK? And apparently, uh, so is Martha, okay? And this is, you know, you've heard people say the Martha spirit opposed to Mary. So if we look at it in, let's see, let's look at it in the Amplified. And it says, but the Lord replied to her, Martha, Martha, you were worried and bothered and anxious about so many things. But only one thing is necessary, for Mary has chosen the good part that which is to her advantage, which will not be taken away from her. And then in the message it says, the master said, Martha, dear Martha, you're fussing far too much and getting yourself worked up over nothing. One thing only is essential, and Mary has chosen it. It's the main course and won't be taken from her. And the bottom line is, that's how we need to always be. Not get caught up in all the other stuff. Just concentrate on what is most important. Now, you're already in Luke, so just go right quickly to Luke 12. And we're going to look at verses 25 through 28. I'm just going to share it with you out of the message so we can move forward. So this is Luke 12, verses 25 through 28 out of the message. And it says... Has anyone by fussing before the mirror ever gotten taller? By so much as an inch. If fussing can't do that, why fuss at all? Walk into the field and look at the wildflowers. Now I'm going to push, press a pause here. Because I have had people say that they have not come to church or they have not gone to an affair for something as simplistic as they had a bad hair day. Now, this uh, we laugh and we think, oh, ha, 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 it's funny. But I'm being honest. People do this. This is the same type of thing. We're missing God's blessings for something as trivial as a bad hair day. Do you really think people care that much about your hair? I mean, can't you tell? They really don't. No. <laughs> what I'm saying is that's not the point. You need to want all God has for you. The rest of this stuff is no big deal. And we're getting caught up on all the wrong things. And he talks about wildflowers, which are absolutely devastatingly beautiful. And most people just walk past them and don't even pay any attention. So back to the scripture. They don't fuss with their appearance, but have you ever seen color and design quite like it? The 10 best dressed men and women in the country look shabby alongside them. If God gives such attention to the wildflowers, most of them never even seen, don't you think he'll attend to you? Take pride in you. Do his best for you. So the point is, we have to get to a point where we truly just trust God. And in order to truly trust him, you've got to know who he is. You've got to know his character. You have to understand that. And if you do, <laughs> your life is absolutely wonderful. If not, your tranquility is destroyed. Your peace of mind is destroyed. And notice the word destroyed is used. It's not just put up on the shelf and every now and then. It's destroyed, meaning you will not have it. You can run helter-skelter and just be a total disaster. And that's not at all what God wants. Even relationships that you have with other people, like one of the quotes that I happen to really like, it's up on my wall in uh, my office at home. It's written by Pascal, and it says, happiness is neither within us nor without us. It is within our relationship with God. That's, that says a lot, exactly, because 
It's not how much money you have. It's not how much things you can collect. It's not how much stuff you can get. It's your relationship with God. That's where you're going to find true happiness. The rest of it, uh, no, not so. You just kind of like deluding yourself if you really, really think that. So the other thing we talked about was how we're not going to allow anything to put us in a position where we feel as if we can't achieve all that God has for us. And one of the things, I had given you a quote that, um, <laughs> that I learned from Minister Scott, and everybody liked this, so that's why I'm repeating it, because it is a really, really valuable quote that says, I am as old as the universe and as young as a brand new day. Because one of the things this society, and I'm sure many of you can agree, is very, um, how can I put it? They, they give you a hard time if you're over the age of about 35. They kind of feel like you're outdated and you're ready to be put out to pasture. Okay, I am not going to anybody's pasture, all right? But that's sort of like how they see you. Like, okay, no, you can't do this job. You're old. We read, actually, it's really a lie. We know it's a lie, but here's what they're really doing. They really don't want a person who has the experience that can help. They really are trying to get some young person who's out of school, who's just begging for any kind of job, and if you give them a job, we'll pay them next to nothing, and we'll give that to them and then tell you that, you know, you're too old. It's really them just working a system of using people. That's really what it is. They just don't want to say it that way. So they just kind of make it feel like, well, you're too old, and put you over to the side, and let's just give it to somebody else young. And we know full well they don't know. I mean, you know, there's a lot they don't know. I mean, it's interesting to me how there are all types of businesses. For instance, you can go into any fine dining restaurant, okay, anywhere in the city. Somewhere in the office of the manager, there's going to be an MOD, which is a manual. Uh, well, it's actually, depending on how you look at it, it's going to be a manual. And it's going to teach you the operation of the restaurant. I tell you this. It's nice, they have it in there because you're supposed to have a code. You know, we have OSHA, we have different things we have to deal with. But running that restaurant has very little to do with what's in that manual. So you get somebody who's never run a restaurant and you give them this manual and tell them, here, this is how you're going to go run the front of the house and greet the customers. This is what you're going to do. And they're sitting there flipping through trying to figure it out. It doesn't work that way. It's the experience that makes a difference. The experience is what somebody can come in and run it and it runs like a well oil machine. Well, it's another trick of the enemy. It's another snare. It's another little thing that he does. But we have to start discerning those things so that we don't get caught up in that. So if you go somewhere, I don't care if you are 70 and you decide you want to go back to college to get a degree. Do you know Pearl Bailey? I don't know if anybody remembers her. She was 80 years old when she graduated. I always thought that is a wonderful thing. So we don't have to ever be limited by anything. And as far as retirement, everybody has their own view on it. I will retire when I transition. Until then, I am on the job and I got things to do and people to see and places to go. And it's, it's all in how you look at a thing. So we need to kind of amp up how we look at things and line it up with God. Nowhere in the word have I ever seen where it said retirement. Nowhere in the word did I ever see where it said when you're over 35, you're done. Nowhere in the word did I ever see we can't do whatever it is that we want to do as long as we keep God first and we're doing it according to his plan and purpose. So don't buy into it. Just don't. Please don't. Now we're going to look at, well, we're going to consider the fact that the Gospel of Luke, the fourth chapter, it gives us an illustration of how the same battle that we're talking about <laughs> raged in Christ's life. See, many people think, and we need to adjust our thinking on this. If nothing else out of this series, I want you to adjust your thinking. And you're going to have to do it more than once. It's going to be a continual process where you're adjusting your thinking. Because people often will not ever think of themselves as joint heirs with Jesus. They won't because it is true that he is sovereign. He is part of the deity. He is to be adored 
He is to be loved. He is to be respected. There is no question about that. However, he came here and clothed himself in flesh, and he walked this earth to give us a living example of what it is that God had for us. So we can't get to a point where we don't stop and see what he did, what he experienced, so that we can try to do the same thing. Because if we don't do that, we're just scratching on the surface of the situation. We're not getting to the root of what it means to be a Christian. Because think about it, to be a Christian, a follower of Christ, means that we are supposed to learn of him and do the things that he did and follow in his footsteps. No, we aren't him, we get that, but we're supposed to want to be that way to the best of our ability. Would you agree with that? Okay. So. We know, <laughs> we don't think, I'll, I'll put it this way, we don't think that when Jesus walked the earth, he needed to have on armor. We just assume he was the son of God. So therefore, he could just do whatever needed to be done as the son of God. Okay, well think about this. We know that he came here as a solution to provide our salvation, right? Why didn't he just go on and die? Okay, what did he have three and a half years of ministry for? What did he do that for? What was that for? That was just because he had nothing else to do with his time? If it was just to provide our salvation by his death on the cross, he could have just gone ahead and done that. He didn't have to have a ministry where he needed armor. But I submit to you, he had that ministry where he needed armor to show us as a living example how to take up that armor and do what he did. That was the whole point. Isn't it a lot easier sometimes to be able to look at what someone does and duplicate it? You know, think about it. If you are trying to make your first Thanksgiving dinner, and why do you think YouTube is all the rage? And why the Food Network has videos on how to make stuff? Because it's easier sometimes for you to be able to see. Meaning, I remember my first recipe of making a pound cake, and they told me I had to cream the butter. I'm like, what, what cream the butter? What does that mean? You just put it in here and stir it up. That, that's cream. No, it's not. You need to beat that thing. But at the time when I learned how to do it, they didn't have videos. <laughs> I mean, so I had to do it by trial and error. But the point is, it's a lot easier for you to see. So Jesus, he was our human video, okay, where we were able to see. But we've got to open up the book to be able to follow along, to really be able to understand what he did. So turn with me to Matthew's Gospel, the 13th chapter. Because you see, Jesus never preached, healed the sick, or cast out demons as the son of God. He was the son of God without question, but he wasn't working miracles because he was the son of God. He was a prophet anointed by the spirit of God. But turn with me, you should be at Matthew 13. We're gonna look at verse 57. If we look at it in the new King James version, are you there yet? Yes. It says that a prophet is not without honor except in his own country and in his own house. If we look at it in the Living Bible, it says, and they became angry with him. Then Jesus told them, a prophet is honored everywhere, except in his own country and among his own people. The expanded Bible puts it this way. So the people were upset with, offended by Jesus. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is honored everywhere, not dishonored, except in his hometown and in his own home, family, household. And the Amplified says it this way, and they took offense at him, refusing to believe in him. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and in his own household. <clears throat> he was talking about himself because even people in his own hometown didn't receive him as a prophet. And while he was a prophet, he also was the son of God, but he laid aside his son of God prerogative to minister how as a man. That's why he was called the son of man. That's why we call him that. He was one of us, so he had to use his armor just as we do. Now, 
there's some encouragement on a lot of levels with this because we need to understand that we are not going to always receive honor in our own hometown. Because you see, we all have a story to tell. And we did not, we were not born from infancy into being a believer. You live some life. Now, one of the things that I profess over my grandchildren is that they accept Jesus at an early age because you don't want them to have to go through the life so many of us went through, okay, before accepting Jesus. But the point being is we've had some sordid past. Everybody was not this wonderful little person. You know, sometimes people did have things they needed to be delivered from. Sometimes people sinned and sinned really well. Okay, so the point being is, and that's why it's so wonderful that all of our sins go into the sea of forgetfulness. So we don't have to be bound by that. But the point that I'm making to you is some of your running buddies and some of your friends who may not have accepted Jesus remember you sitting at the bar, okay, smoking that cigarette and seeing how much Hennessy you could get down in one night. Okay, they remember that. So then when you come and you're trying to talk to them about Jesus, all they remember is the smoke and the Hennessy. Okay, and then if you're a guy, you're like trying to, you know, talk to one of your fellas and everything, and they remember you making it rain. Okay, and they're like, well, wait a minute. Aren't you the same guy who was sitting there letting that woman lap dance on you and all this stuff? I'm supposed to listen to you about Jesus? I mean, but this is real. We have to understand that and be encouraged because guess what? They did the same thing to Jesus. So don't let it bother you. That's why it's so wonderful that you can go and you can share the good news of Jesus outside of your own hometown. Go and talk to somebody who only knows you now. Okay, where well you're all now clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. They don't have to know about how you used to be, but you can still share that good news. Why not do that? I mean, to me, I think that's extremely encouraging. But, you know, you have to figure that out. Turn with me to Luke's Gospel, the 19th chapter, and we're going to look at verse 10. Now, if we look at it in the New King James Version, it says, for the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which is lost. To save the lost necessitated his death, but it certainly, like I said to you before, it didn't take him three and a half years, okay, the length of his entire earthly ministry to die. He could have just gone ahead and done that. If we look at this in the Living Bible, it says, Jesus told him, this shows that salvation has come to this home today. Now, this really is the story, and I'm sure you already know the story of uh, Zacchaeus. He was a rich man who wanted to hear what Jesus was saying, but he was short in stature, okay? So he actually climbed up. He did whatever it took to be able to hear what Jesus had to say. So this is what it means when it says <laughs> he came to, I mean, he was saying that salvation has come to this home today, this man has one of the, this man was one of the lost sons of Abraham, and I, the Messiah, have come to search for and to save such souls as his. Now, here is the thing. You hear me say all the time, at the end of whenever I minister, wherever God is, wherever you are, God is, because God is within us. So, that's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. All three of those things dwell in you as a believer. So if, in fact, the mind of Christ is to save that which is lost, then that means that's how we're supposed to be. And we're not supposed to be that way when we just stop and think about it. We're supposed to be that way all the time. Now, I will admit that some people have a certain gift when it comes to evangelism. And when we stop and think of somebody like Billy Graham who led hundreds of thousands of people to Christ, okay, we, that may not be our gifting that way, but that does not mean that we don't need to share it with people instead of just not bothering to share it at all. Because here's the question that I always have to ask you. Suppose nobody shared it with you. I mean, did you ever stop to think about that? Suppose nobody ever shared the good news of Jesus with you. Where would you be today? So don't you think that you should just consider sharing it with somebody else so that they have the same rights and privileges that you now possess? I mean, isn't that only just decent? Okay? So it's something that we need 
to think about. If you look at back to the same verse of scripture, if we look at it in the expanded, it says, for because the son of man came to find, seek out lost people and save them. That's what he came for. And then the Amplified says, for the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. But now I'm going to read it to you in a way that I want you to really think about it out of the Amplified, only this time, because I want you to really get the whole backstory and understand it. Um, we're going to start with verse 1 and go to verse 10 out of the Amplified. And it says it this way. And I want you to start thinking about it because you're going to be able to see people in your own life, hopefully, that would do a similar thing, or they're craving the word the same way that Zacchaeus was. And you need to ask to become sensitive to that. So starting with verse one, it says, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through, just like we could be entering uptown, passing through, okay? And there was a man called Zacchaeus, and he was a chief tax collector, a superintendent to whom others reported, and he was rich. Zacchaeus was trying to see who Jesus was, but he could not see because of the crowd, for he was short in stature. So he ran on ahead of the crowd and climbed up in a sycamore tree in order to see him, for he was about to pass through that way. When Jesus reached the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for today I must stay at your house. So Zacchaeus hurried and came down and welcomed Jesus with joy. When the people saw it, they all began muttering in discontent. Now we know how that can be. We can do something here. You can have somebody come into the church and somebody doesn't think that they came in dressed properly and you hear murmuring and discontent. It's just as ugly as what the people did here. Now back to the scripture. He has gone to be the guest of a man who is a notorious sinner. Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, See, Lord, I am now giving half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anyone out of anything, I will give back four times as much. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this household because he, too, is a spiritual son of Abraham, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. The point being is... If you notice in the beginning, it was talking about how Zacchaeus was rich. You may have someone that you know who could be what the world would consider rich. And you might look at it like, well, I don't want to approach them. Why not? Wherever you are, God is. So it really doesn't matter what earthly possessions they have. It, I look forward to the day that the right person approaches some of the people in the cabinet of our country, okay? It does not matter what their position is. Is their position better than God? So don't ever allow that lie, which is another trick of the enemy, to be something to infiltrate your mind and take up space there. Because wherever you are, you need to, I almost, would like for you to start getting up in the morning and saying that. Here I am, Lord, use me, and wherever I am, you are. You need to start wearing that. You need to start understanding that. Because when you do, your whole entire life takes on a totally different, it, it's just completely different. Like, and I don't know who this is for, this is something that's been in my spirit all day. So I'm going to share it. There are people, this is Christmas time, and you hear me get all excited, I am thrilled. I mean, this is my favorite time of the year. I really do love it. But for a lot of people, Christmas is very stressful. And for a lot of believers, it's very stressful. And I can understand it because I can understand before my faith was at the level, because as, in case you don't remember, and you've heard me say this, we live life on levels and we arrive in stages. That's why you want your faith to be ever increasing. It's not always going to be at the same level. So I remember when it was really challenging for me to be able to come up with a gift 
for my children. And for a lot of people, they get caught up into what the world system is. You know, like everybody you know is supposed to get a gift and they get all stressed out because they don't have the money for it. And money can be challenging sometimes. You don't always have as much in your hand as you would like to have. But you know what? You need to understand, I do. I know what it's like to be abased. And I know what it's like to abound. To abound is better, but neither one affects my faith. Because the point of the matter is, your faith and your confidence and your trust have to be in the God that you serve. So if you weren't able to get everybody whatever Christmas gift you wanted to get them, do you realize that you have in your possession the greatest gift that you could give to anyone? bigger and better than a zillion dollars, which to me should be a little higher than a trillion, because you can share with them. If they already know Jesus, you can share with them a praise report of something he's done for you. The point is, that is the greatest gift. So don't allow the fact that you could not buy people everything you thought you wanted them to have. Don't, 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 even, don't even think about that because it's not important. The other thing that I see people do is when it comes to their tithe and their offering, they will honestly sit there, and again, I guess they think God isn't seeing it. I mean, he sees everything, okay? They will shortchange their tithe to be able to squeak out some extra money for a bill, and I'm not judging them, okay? Because I've been there, I get it. But here's what you gotta understand. Again, it's another trick of the enemy. Because as it is, and you hear me always talk about stacks of bills. Now, why do I almost know this? Maybe because I'm in finance, maybe because I understand it, and maybe it's because I know what it's like to have a family of seven and not always having all the money in my hand that in the natural I need, okay? Like, it would be wonderful if I had $20,000 every single month for everything that I need. Yeah, I know, right? Your eyes were lit up too. Yeah, I, um, yeah, right? Okay, that would be perfect. That does not always happen. Okay, so the point of the matter is I then have decisions I have to make. I'll never forget, and I don't know why I'm going off on this, but it's for somebody, so that's why I'm willing to share it. There was one time that my husband and I had three children in university all at the same time, and they didn't choose state schools, okay? And we, <laughs> we wanted them to have whatever they wanted. Okay, so therefore they went to Georgetown. They went to, they went to the schools that make you sit down and go, woo, when they give you the bill, okay? We had three of them in university at the same time, but we never lost our faith. So the point was when it came down to, okay, you gotta pay this bill or you have to pay your tithe, the tithe was never a question. Because here's why. And it's really almost logical. It's not even all that spiritual. It tells me in Deuteronomy that he will do what? He will rebuke the devourer on my behalf. I just have to be obedient. So if I'm sitting down trying to figure out, OK, do I tithe or do I pay this bill? I will call the bill company and work something out because I'm paying my tithe because I want the God who created all that there is to be rebuking the devourer on my behalf. I know that bill collector is not rebuking anybody on my behalf. All he's going to do is have somebody else call and tell how much I owe and could care less about me. So all I'm saying to you is don't allow anything. I don't care if it's Christmas. I don't care if it's whatever you owe. It can be worked out if you trust God because he promised what? He promised to meet every single need you have, not part of it or a piece of it, but every need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. He owns the cattle on a thousand hell. The earth and the fullness belong to him. So guess what? Sit back, relax, and trust him and enjoy your life because that's what he wants you to do. Why in the world would he create you to just sit up and struggle and have a horrible time? But the enemy can do what? He'll steal your joy. It always says steal your joy, which means he has to come up with a way to come in and connive and take it from you. He can only do it if you give it to him. Don't ever give him that place. Just do not. Praise God. So. 
with that, let's look at Luke's gospel. And because again, we're gonna go back to the fact that Jesus hung around here to show us how to live. That is exactly what he did. And he wants us to do it the same way that he did it, put on the same armor that he put on. So if we do that, we're gonna look at, let's see. If we look at the third verse of Luke 4, it's really telling us and it's showing us, <laughs> it's showing us exactly just how cool and calculating the devil thinks he really is. Because we all know this story about how Jesus had just been on a fast for 40 days and 40 nights. Now, we can all think about how that is for ourselves, fasting, really fasting with nothing for 40 days and 40 nights. Some of us have a hard time doing that for four hours, no less, for 40 days and 40 nights. Okay? So, of course, the enemy figured he was going to have some fun, okay, with Jesus. And he says, if you are the son of God, command this st stone to become bread. He spoke a simple statement, literally <laughs> just a thought, but the suggestion behind it was clear. And that was, I know you're hungry. <laughs> You've been out here for 40 days with nothing to eat. So why don't you just turn that rock into bread and satisfy your hunger? Notice again what it says. If you are the son of God. Now, where have we seen that before? Didn't the serpent do that with Eve of if? Because again, it's still trying to plant a thought, an idea, or a suggestion, and to cast some type of doubt. That is what the enemy does. He tries to cast doubt on your relationship with God. He's battling for what? Your mind. It all starts up here. That's where your battle begins. And that's what he's always trying to get after. But notice what he didn't ask. He didn't ask, now since you are the son of God, why don't you command this stone to be made into bread? He didn't ask that because he wanted to cast doubt. He wanted to get Jesus to question, am I really the son of God? Hmm. Now, if he did that to Jesus, who is the son of God, what in the world do you think he's going to do to you? Mm -hmm. Do you not think he's going to make you question things? Okay, when it is your rent is due on the 1st and it is the 30th and you have no idea where the rent's coming from, okay, and he's reminding you, especially when you go to lie down to have sweet sleep, he's reminding you, oh, yeah, well, you know, the 1st is here. And, you know, they're doing all kinds of things because actually they're trying to get you out of your apartment anyway because, you know, you're not paying as much and they really want to bring it and give it to somebody else. And some of you have rent control apartments. They're really trying to boot you out of those. All of these things come to your mind. What do you do with them? Well, we can do exactly what Jesus did. <laughs> because here's the other thing, and you have to look at it this way. Satan, and we talked about this last time, he's really one of the dumbest people you ever wanted to meet. Because if he were smart, he'd read the back of the book and know he's lost. He doesn't do anything really all that different. He's doing the same thing over and over again. And why should he change how he's doing things? Because if you have a winning formula, you don't change it. Now, the, for instance, the gentleman who actually founded McDonald's, his name was Ray Kroc. That was many, many years ago. Do you know they're still using the same recipe for those McDonald's hamburgers all over the world? I went to Spain and McDonald's was the same as it is here. I went to Mexico, McDonald's is the same as it is here. They are not changing. Why? Because they have people all over the world standing in line to buy those wonderful little hamburgers called from McDonald's. So the point is, why should the enemy change what he's doing? It's working, and it's effective. And it's not until we say, I've had enough. And I'll tell you this. When you get that way in your life, where you finally say, enough is enough, he will back off away from you. He will literally back off. Like he knows full well certain things don't even begin to think about stepping to me with that because I already know I have authority. Don't even try it. And he's almost like a little sniveling dog who will run the other way. But it's not till you get that way flat-footed and mean it. But you can't do that if you don't know 
what the word says. You, you're just guessing. You've got to be able to know like you know your name. So let's look at Luke 4.4. 4. And it specifically says, Jesus answered, it is written in the scriptures, a person does not live on bread alone. And the message says, Jesus answered by quoting Deuteronomy, it takes more than bread to really live. And in the Amplified, it says, Jesus told him, it is written, and I love the Amplified because I love how they explain it. It is written and forever remains written. Man shall not live by bread alone. So the point being is, we need to also do that ourselves. We need to understand that it is written and forever remains written. Okay, whatever you are standing on, it is written and forever remains written. And you need to put it that way in your mind and say it that way because our minds are the arena, the gateways to what? Our spirit. And you've heard me say this before. Whatever is in your mind does have an effect on your spirit because it is the gateway to that arena. And whatever is in your spirit is what you believe. And that is where your faith comes from based on what you believe. And depending upon what you believe will have everything to do with your actions actions and with what you say. Like the example I just gave you about it being the 30th and your rent is due on the 1st, depending upon how you do that thing, you could react to it like, you know what? I don't see the money, don't know where it's coming from, have no idea, but I do know that my father has promised to meet my need and I also know that he said that I am his beloved and I am to have sweet sleep, so I'm gonna lie down and sleep. And you know what? Father, I thank you. You got this. I don't know where it's coming from, but I believe that the need is met. And go on to sleep. It's two ways of looking at it. Or you can sit there and wrestle and go on, but just like we read earlier, you can't even add a cubit, which is like an inch. You can't add an inch to your to to your to your life, to your, to your stature. You can't add an inch to it. You can't look in the mirror and I can't look in the mirror and say, okay, I don't want to use henna today. I just want the gray hair to go away. No, you better go find some henna if you don't want to see the gray. Okay, because it's not going to just happen. We have to understand. But, and I'm not saying these things to be funny, but I'm trying to give you ways to really think about it where we live and understand it. This is real. And <laughs> my whole reason for trying to be as authentic as I know how to be with you is because I do know what it's like not to know the richness of the word of God. I do know what it's like to not have any idea why I'm here and what I'm supposed to do with this thing called life. I know what it's like to have five beautiful children who are looking at my husband and I. And my husband for over, I would say, now we're looking at about 40 years. Wow, that means we are really getting older. But anyway, about 40 years who have not had a quote unquote job, but we have had to live by faith. Because you see, if you don't have a quote unquote paycheck coming in and you have to trust and believe God, you've got to understand what it means to say that faith is your currency for the kingdom. So if you're believing how to pay for the three tuitions, if you're believing how to pay for oil to make sure that you're not in a coal house, if you're believing for how am I gonna look at these five children, and I can say not one day has gone that they have gone without food to eat, okay? For to do that and you don't have a means that they're cutting you a check every Friday and you are just trusting a God who you cannot see, this is real to me. And, you know, I was thinking about it earlier and I was like, Lord, all I want is I just want you to get it. I just want you to understand that this word of God is real. It's not a fairy tale. It's not something that we just come and it sounds good and it's to make you feel encouraged. It's not meant just for inspiration. It's as if, imagine yourself 
out in the middle of an ocean with water all around you and there's no lifeboat and there's no life vest and you don't know how to swim and the water is coming up over your head and you are gulping and gulping and gulping and you know that if something doesn't intervene, you are going to check out and die because you don't have anything to help you. And then somebody reaches forth with a hand and pulls you up out of that and lets you stand tall and live. Well, that is what the word of God has done for me. It has offered that hand where I am so blessed because I have five children who were born again, who are spirit-filled, who love God, who understand faith. And that's all I want for every other person who lives. And it's something that's so real to me. And I just want you to get it. And I keep just asking the Lord, please use me to meet the needs of your people. Because if you can get that, you have no idea how wonderful your life can be. No, there are times where, I, yeah, I still have that $20,000 a month. And the $20,000 may not be there, but I'm not stressing over it. Because it's like Jesse Duplantis says, Jesus, you got mail. <laughs> okay, <laughs> figure it out, okay? Because that's not, my job right. is to be obedient yeah. and to live my life uprightly before you. And you know what? I have to say, nobody takes care of me better than him. And he does that. So, I mean, we just have to truly adjust our thinking. Thanks for joining us. Our hope is that you received something that you can apply to your life and strengthen your faith. At Crenshaw Christian Center, New York, we believe that the Word of God is practical for everyday application. If you'd like to support the ministry with your tithe and offering, you can mail them to Crenshaw Christian Center, New York, 450 7th Avenue, Suite 2111, New York, New York, 10123. We also offer the convenience of mobile and online giving. It's safe and secure. Try it now. From your smartphone, simply text East G to 28950 and follow the prompts. You can even specify a designation for your gift. Text East G for general donation, East T for tithe, East O for offering, or East AL to donate to the Apostles Library. Each transaction needs to be its own individual text message. You can also visit our website, CrenshawChristianCenterEast.org, and click the Give tab to begin your experience. Set up recurring donations or give one-time gifts. This giving method is easy to use, safe and secure, and requires a one-time registration only. After your first gift, giving will be completely simple. Simply text East G to 28950 with your information securely stored. We appreciate your continued support and stand in agreement with you for the manifold return on your life. Thanks again for watching. And remember, we walk by faith, not by sight. We would like you, our viewers and partners, to join us in honoring the legacy of the Apostle by making a donation to the Apostle Frederick K. C. Price Library. The library will be on the grounds of the Faith Dome in Los Angeles, California, and it will be open to the public. It will be a place of study, learning, and research, available for anyone desiring to further their knowledge and understanding of the Christian faith. Visitors will also have a chance to learn more about our founder and his impact on the body of Christ and the world at large. You can mail your donations to Crenshaw Christian Center, New York, 450 7th Avenue, Suite 2111, New York, New York, 10123. If you are giving by check, be sure to designate in the memo area, Apostles Library. If you have Crenshaw Christian Center envelopes, you can mark AL on the envelope. You can also donate via your smartphone by texting East AL to 28950 and follow the prompts. We thank you in advance for your support. And as always, we stand in agreement for the manifold return in your life.